Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our services here at Commissary. And we welcome those of you that are on Facebook also. In a few minutes when our class is over, we'll have announcements. I do want to mention a few of the sick right now, though. Uh, remember Louise Banks and, and Ken Burrow? He had a PET scan, and he's waiting for the results on that. Remember Emmett Vick, who's had a bilateral amputation of his legs? Um, remember Jess and Dixie Brown? They've uh, had COVID. They're recovering. And uh, Roger Jones, that's uh, Kathy Rothies and, and Francis Dacus' uh, nephew. He's going to have uh, uh, surgery soon, don't know when, uh, on his arteries. Um, and remember Camille Uretic, Norma Reeves, Daniel Lindsay, and there are others that are listed in the bulletin that we need to remember uh, when we pray. Let's bow and go ahead and start our class then with a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this day and thankful for the opportunity that we have tonight to gather together to worship you and to study your word and to fellowship with each other. And we're so thankful for all your blessings, especially Jesus who came into this world and lived a perfect life and died for us. And we're thankful for the grace that you offer to us through him. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to be in your family. We're thankful for uh, the church, thankful for your Holy Spirit, uh, thankful for all your spiritual blessings and physical blessings too. Help us to uh, be appreciative of these and to show our appreciation by the way that we live. We pray that you'll be with these sick that we've mentioned tonight, that you'll bless them in a very special way, you'll be with their caregivers and also their families. We pray that you give them what they most need at this time. Be with us tonight as we study your word. Help us always to strive to live according to the precepts that we find therein. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, we are in uh, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation, the 11th chapter. Now, uh, I don't know table in the foyer, there is a, a summary of chapters one through nine that we handed out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but uh, if you don't have one of those, you might want to pick one up sometime. And uh, we'll give further uh, summaries uh, later. And uh, chapter 11 uh, is a very difficult uh, chapter. And when we started this last week, uh, we quoted several uh, well-known scholars whose uh, message was the same, that uh, this is uh, generally acknowledged to be one of the most perplexing sections in, in the whole book of, of Revelation. And there are a lot of different uh, interpretations of it, and uh, uh, some of them are way out there, and uh, some of them uh, do, do make sense. But that's true with the entire book of, of uh, Revelation. But uh, if you'll uh, look again at your questions, question number one, uh, what was given uh, to John? And we talked about this, it was a measuring uh, rod. Uh, and uh, what was he to do with it? He was to measure uh, the temple of God, the altar, and those that worship in it. Uh, measure the temple, uh, measure the altar, measure those that are in it. Now, uh, the book of Revelation is a book that uses a lot of figurative language, a lot of symbols. And uh, there was no physical temple at the time that John wrote this. Uh, the original temple was uh, built by Solomon. Uh, almost a thousand years before Jesus was born. It took him seven years to uh, build it. And uh, it was destroyed in 586 by Nebuchadnezzar from uh, Babylon. Uh, and when the uh, Jews got the opportunity to go back from captivity to Jerusalem, they were allowed to rebuild the temple. And uh, that took uh, quite a while, but it was rebuilt and uh, finished in uh, what we believe was 516 
uh, B.C. In 20 B.C., Herod the Great started remodeling the uh, temple. And uh, it took 46 years uh, for this to uh, be finished. Uh, and it uh, really wasn't finished in, until uh, uh, about A.D. 26 or so. But he remodeled it, added to it, and, and uh, refurbished it. But that temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. when uh, Rome conquered Jerusalem. So when he tells uh, uh, John to uh, take a measuring device and measure the temple, he's not talking about the physical temple because uh, Solomon's temple is gone. Uh, the rebuilt temple that was remodeled by Herod was gone. They're not there. So he's not talking uh, about that. Uh, and then he says, uh, you, you measure the altar. Now, this temple must refer to something else besides a physical temple. And the altar probably uh, is associated with uh, uh, the worship that is in the temple, uh, especially the prayers. And then he says, and you measure the people that are in it, you know. Well, uh, when the temple uh, was in existence, uh, uh, various people, uh, Jewish people worshiped in it, but they're all gone. So these probably are all uh, symbolic of, of something else. The word temple can refer to the human body. Uh, if you will, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, Paul, uh, in verses uh, 19 and 20, uh, well, if you, if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, the verses preceding uh, verse 19, he's talking about the physical body. And then he says in verses 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore, therefore glorify God in your body. So he's talking about the physical body. Our physical bodies uh, have been described as temples uh, of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the temple was a dwelling place for, for God. And he says, God dwells in, 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 your, in your body. And so that's why I call it a, a temple. So a temple can refer to, the, to the physical, our physical bodies. But it can also refer to the church itself. Uh, go back to the third chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians. Go back to chapter 3 and uh, look at verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Now, uh, some of them might say, well, what's the difference in, in those verses and the verses that we just read from chapter 6? Context is everything. He's speaking to the whole church here. Uh, and he's speaking of, of uh, the church. And in, in the sixth chapter, he's speaking about the physical body. So uh, they're, they're, they, don't, they don't mean the same thing. One is the church. The temple is the church. And then the other one is our physical bodies could be uh, the temple, a dwelling place for God. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians 6, look at verse uh, 16. Uh, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, plural, are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they should be my people. And uh, so uh, there he mentions that we, 
together are the temple of God. And so I believe that what he's talking about here as far as measuring the temple, he's not talking about the, the physical temple that has uh, long ago uh, been destroyed. He's not talking about the, the physical body, but he's talking about the church itself. You measure uh, the church. And then when he says measure the altar, we don't have a physical altar. Uh, we, we don't in churches of Christ anyway. Uh, and, and, the, and the altar, again, would represent the worship. You measure their worship. You measure the people that are in it, you know. And, and, and uh, members, Christians are in the church, not talking about this edifice here, uh, brick and mortar. We're in God's uh, body, the church. And so I think he's saying, now you take a measuring rod and, and you, uh, you measure the church. Not the physical one, but the church. And you measure the worship. And you measure the people that are in it. Uh, and uh, mo most of your conservative scholars, uh, you don't know, have ideas that are, that are pretty close, closely associated with, with that. Now, uh, so, uh, you measure the church. You measure their worship. You measure the people in it. Uh, but we go back to the measuring rod. What, what, what's, what's the measuring rod? Well, it can't be the, the ideas and the, and the doctrines of men. Doctrines of men are so often wrong. It just can't be what people think, you know. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, some people, when they get together to study the Bible, they say, well, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And everyone's opinion is right. <laughs> uh, but, but if you go by the opinions of, of men, you're going to have all kinds of uh, thoughts out there. And so that can't be the measuring device. can't be the thoughts of men. It has to be the correct standard, you know. If we're going to measure, uh, you know, how tall someone is, we need to have a, a ruler that's accurate, you know. If we're going to measure how heavy someone is, we need a scale that's accurate. And you measure me, I'd rather not be accurate to, on, on the downside. But uh, you need an accurate scale. You need a standardized uh, scale. Well, what is the measuring rod? Well, I believe that it would... What do you think the measuring rod is? Okay, Charlie's pointing at his Bible. The Word of God. That, you know, by, by what else can you measure it? Can you measure it by some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, book that a man has written? No, you measure it by the Word of God. Now, in John 12, 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. Measuring rod is the Word of God. Uh, in uh, Revelation uh, 20 and 12, uh, later in this, this same uh, uh, book, uh, John said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of the things written in the books according to their works. Uh, now, he says the books were open, and another book was open. He, he, not, he tells what that other book was, it's the book of life. But what are these books? Well, I have every reason to believe He's talking about the Old Testament, New Testament, talking about the Word of God. People that lived under the old system will be judged by the old. Those that lived under the new system will be judged by the new. But that's the measuring rod. Uh, and I, th I think it's uh, that, uh, that simple. Uh, and, you know, uh, he is speaking to the seven churches of Asia. Uh, and they needed to... You know, they needed to submit themselves to the measuring test. How do you measure up as a congregation? How, how, how does your worship measure up? How do your members measure up? Uh, in Daniel, the fifth chapter, you have uh, Belshazzar, uh, who, who is the, the king of, of, uh, of Judah. And uh, he, he's the one that saw the handwriting on the wall. And when the handwriting was, uh, was interpreted, uh, it says, you, uh, you have been, uh, quote that for me, uh, uh, 
You've been weighed, weighed in the balances, yeah, wanting. and found wanting. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. He'd been measured, you know, and he'd been found wanting. So when we're measured, and what's going to be the measuring device? It's going to be the Word of God. Are we going to be found wanting? Uh, and how about our worship, you know, our items of worship? When, we're, when we measure them, are, are they going to measure up to what the Word of God teaches? You know, and how about us individually? You know, and, and I believe that's simply what he's saying here. Now, when you read those first uh, uh, few chapters of Revelation, especially chapters 2 and 3, <laughs> these churches, for the most part, did not measure up. And they, they needed to be measured. Uh, and they needed to use the correct measuring device, the Word of God. So, and we're going to discuss this here in a little bit. What was the purpose of, of, of measuring the, the, uh, the temple, the church, the altar, the worship, the people inside, the Christians? Well, the Lord wants to protect his people. You know, and, and that's a message that, that keeps coming over and over and over in the book of Revelation. You know, he, he wants to provide protection uh, for them. Protection, uh, you know, he, he, he might, he might uh, not, he, he will protect you through the storm. Maybe not from the storm, but he'll protect you through the storm. And, and they were about to have a lot of storms. They're about to have a lot of problems. Some of the churches already had. And, and so he wants to know who measures up. Now, question number two then. Uh, look at it. Okay. First of all, you measure the temple. You measure the holy place. You measure the people that are in it. And, and, and uh, I, I, I feel absolutely uh, confident that the measuring rod would be the word of God. Then question number two, what was John told to leave out? He said, you measure the temple, but I want you to leave out what? The courtyard. Okay, the courtyard. Look, look, out, look at verse two. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Uh, now, uh, the temple with which they would have been most familiar, uh, it, it had only been destroyed 40 or 50 years earlier, uh, was comprised uh, of, of several courts. Now, the original uh, tabernacle, it had, a, it had a holy place and it had a most holy place. And then it had the, uh, it, it, it had the, the court outside of the, of the tabernacle. Uh, but Herod's temple, uh, it had the holy place, and it had the most holy place. The holy place, again, was where, where uh, only the priests could enter and, and perform their duties. Most holy place, only the high priest could go in there, and he could only do that on one day a year. Sometimes we say, well, he went in there once a year, but he probably went in two or three times on that day. It was only one day, day of atonement. Now... Uh, when we uh, when we read about uh, the the Christians in the New Testament going into the temple, they didn't go into the holy place. Jesus himself would not have gone into the holy place because he was a he was a law abiding Jew and he had to be a priest and he was not a Levitical priest. Uh, and when you read about these other people being in a temple, it doesn't mean that they were in a holy place. They would have been in one of these other courts. You had a court of Israel. And this is a court where only the men could go. Uh, women were not allowed in there. And then you had the court of the women. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the women had their own, own place where they, they could worship a part, of the, a part of the temple grounds. And then you had one other, and it was the court of the Gentiles. And sometimes it's referred to as the outer court. It's the furthest away from the holy place and the most holy place. Uh, and... Uh, he says here, uh, leave out the court which is outside the temple. And it would seem like he's talking about the uh, court of the Gentiles. Uh, well, what does this refer to? The word Gentile 
doesn't always mean a non-Jew. Uh, sometimes the writers take a little license and, 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 and the word Gentile would simply refer to someone who was a sinner. Uh, and, and some scholars have thought that he might be talking about non-Christians here. You know, don't be measuring them, leave them out. Or he might be talking about the unfaithful Christians. You know, uh, those that don't measure up. Those that are in the church, but they don't measure up. Uh, if you want to receive God's protection, then, then you need to, need to measure up. Five of the seven congregations were told that they need to repent. And, and you know, we've gone over that, uh, you know, the two congregations. Uh, what was one congregation that, that, that nothing bad was said about it? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And what was the other one? Smyrna. Smyrna. You had Smyrna and Philadelphia, and they were only two of the seven churches that didn't have anything negative said about them. But the other five, every one of them was told, you repent. Uh, uh, Ephesus was told in second chapter, verse 5, you repent, and if you don't, I'm going to come and remove your candlestick or your lampstand. Um, Pergamum, uh, they, he said, repent, because I'm coming quickly. And then uh, Sardis, uh, the church that was spirits of the dead, he said, you repent because I'm going to come as a thief, you know. And, and so uh, maybe he's talking about unfaithful Christians that didn't measure up. Uh, and he said, you, you, you don't, uh, you know, you, me you, you uh, measure the, the, the church, you measure the worship, you measure uh, the people in it uh, and, and these other people. Uh, and and you, got, you, you have a... Um, you have a message back in, in chapter 10 where, <laughs> where God says, I am through, I'm, I'm through warning you. I've warned you enough, and I, I'm through, you know. And, and this could be a continuation uh, uh, of that. Uh, any comment that you want to make or, or any, anything you want to say here, anybody? I think, I think it was last, uh, last week we talked about, you know, uh, the measurement of a cubit. Yeah. Mm -hmm how that could be a different length. It's interesting to me how the, the standard of measurement, you know, being the word of God, that's that's a, a just standard. It's going to be the same for you, for me, you know. For yeah, the and, 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 you know, truth truth is not relative, you know. And that's, that's a really good point to make, Wes, uh, that a cubit could be, depending on whose arm you're using for the measurements from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, you know. And... Uh, 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 a cubit on on Evan. Do you, you have long arms and, and, and besides long legs? So you're long arm too, huh? Uh, uh, but uh, so a cubit on him would be a lot longer than a cubit on me, you know. Uh, and uh, but the word of God is it, it doesn't change. It doesn't. And and it's the same. Jesus Christ is the same today. Uh, yesterday, today, and, 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 and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. Uh, and, and so that's a really good point. And it doesn't matter if it's in the 21st century or the 1st century. Truth doesn't change. It's, it's constant. So that's a, that's a really good point to make. Okay, any other comment here? So you mean there's no such thing as your truths and my truths and <laughs> what we hear today, not just in the religious world, but I mean just everywhere in general. It's just amazing to me, you know. Uh, you know, now we're being told that there's like 800 genders in the world, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Is it down to that people, number or up to that number? <laughs> people, you know, people say, you have your truth and I have my truth. You hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, it, this means, this. I know what this means to you and here's what it means to me. Well, you know, if, if, if it's something to do with the Bible, you know, and I, if we're talking about hunting or fishing or, or politics, something like that. But if it's something to do with spiritual things, uh, and 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 we're talking about, and you say, well, I think it means this, and I'm sick, think it means this. Either one of us is right, and one of us is wrong, or both of us are wrong. You know, uh, basically. Now, there are timeless truths, and there are timely truths. The timely truths have to do with custom, you know, customs, you know. 
but but here we're you know you're talking about the word of God. It it is it is timeless. It's the same first century as it is in the fifth century, in the sixteenth century, in the twenty first century. It it doesn't doesn't change. And by the way, when you some people think that uh, you know the Ten Commandments were, were given in Exodus twenty, uh, and uh, you know nine of those commandments are repeated in New Testament. Uh, the, the commandment about keeping the Sabbath was was a it was a timely you know it was for that time you worship worship you still worship God but you worship on Saturday then and, and we worship on on the first day now but uh, when you stop to think about it it didn't all of a sudden become wrong to uh, uh, to take the Lord's name in vain it it, it didn't all of a sudden become wrong uh, to uh, uh, to steal or to commit adultery. Those are timeless truths. They were true from the very beginning. They're eternal truths. That doesn't change. And, and, the, and the Ten Commandments gave them a, 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 a greater emphasis. And then whenever uh, Christianity was ushered in, they're repeated. Why? Because they are eternal truths. Uh, and and uh, truth, truth doesn't, it doesn't change. It, it isn't relative. Uh, and you don't change the rules of the game in, in the middle of the game either. Uh, okay, any, any other comment here? There was a lady at Marmaduke in a religious discussion one time said, okay, I, yeah, my Bible says that too, and I never did believe it. So, <laughs> so how do you answer that? <laughs> you don't. You don't, you know. I heard about two people discussing baptism one time, and and one of them was uh, making a point that baptism is for the remission of sins, and the other person said, well, uh, why do you say that? And the first person said, well, it's Acts 2.38, says we're baptized for the remission of sins. first person said, well, that, that's not in my Bible. He said, well, let me see your Bible. Sure enough, it wasn't in there. The person had cut it out. So... <laughs> <laughs> Mine was just a preacher story. Your sound like might have been a truth. <laughs> It says down in verse 8 that these two witnesses are going to die in Jerusalem where the Lord was crucified. Yeah. Also, well, over yeah. in chapter, and so we say, yeah, but Jerusalem was destroyed some 20, 30 years prior to that. <coughs> Just because there's a reference to that place, the temple, the mm. altars of the mission in Jerusalem, doesn't mean that the whole context of everything is about the destruction of Jerusalem because chapter Yeah, I do. So, so, yeah. So there, there may be a, a broader picture here other than just a spiritual application. Yeah. Just think about it. I don't have the answer to Yeah. It's, it's sometimes a, a difficult uh, line to draw between the, the figurative and, and the literal, you know, because there are some, you know, these were literal congregations that he spoke to, you know, and they were literal places, you know, and so. Uh, uh, and we're we're going to get to the two witnesses into the into the holy city here, but it won't be tonight. <laughs> but thank you for bringing that up. You know, we'll we'll uh, we're going to stop right there, and we'll take up then uh, with question uh, with question three then on uh, next next Wednesday night.
Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening worship service. We're certainly pleased that you're here. We do have some visitors tonight, and we're thankful for your presence. Uh, we invite you to join us anytime you have an opportunity. Our services will begin in just a minute. I do have a few announcements. Uh, I will, uh, by the time uh, Wednesday night comes around, the announcement sheets are written over and scratched out and written over again. So I'll try to get everything in. I'm going to try to uh, mention those that are sick uh, first. Uh, some of these are, are from, from the bulletin. Let's continue to remember those that are on our sick list. Uh, Louise Banks is, is doing better. Uh, she's still uh, going to be in a wheelchair for a while, and please continue to remember her. Please remember Ken Burrow, and uh, he's still going to be uh, getting some results uh, soon, and so keep him in your prayers. Also, Emmett Vick, who had a bilateral amputation of his legs last week. Jess and Dixie Brown are recovering from COVID and hopefully they're doing okay. Continue to remember uh, Daniel Lindsay and Norma Reeves. Um, Kathy Grothy's nephew, Roger Jones, uh, is gonna have a carotid surgery soon. It, it could be a week or two, so please continue to remember him. Um, I believe that may be all that I have that are on my sick list. Are there others that I need to mention tonight? Okay, um, I'd like to mention also, it's uh, usually we have our potlucks on the second Sunday night of each month, but of course, as you know, this, this is October and we're gonna have a hay ride and a hot dog roast and a potluck on October the 22nd, if the weather permits. So please remember that. And on the 15th, uh, there's going to be, for all that are interested, there's going to be a pumpkin painting Sunday afternoon about 3.30 out here in the Fellowship Building. Jonathan's gonna help to oversee that. If you've got a pumpkin you wanna paint, well, you can bring that on the 15th and uh, there'll be some good, good fellowship there. Uh, This Sunday night, uh, Ken Beaver is going to be here. As you know, he uh, is uh, actually the main man for Hope for Haiti's Children. And uh, he's gonna be in the area. He'll be at Center Hill on that Sunday morning. He'll be here next Sunday evening uh, to give us a report. And uh, so, we will change our services just a little bit, probably won't uh, sing as much, give him just a little more time for his report. And so we're looking forward to that. We know, we know of the, all the problems they're having in, in Haiti, and we, uh, we look forward to hearing what he has to say about it, and maybe he'll have some encouraging words for us about that. Um, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. Are there others that should be made? Tonight in our worship, Wes is going to be directing our singing. Dan Stokes will extend the invitation in a few minutes. Charlie Jackson will lead us in our closing prayer when we end our service. And now as we begin, Thomas Lindsay will lead us in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you that we can be assembled here at this midweek, Father, to worship and to study, Father. Father, lay aside the things that are happening in our lives here and contemplate, Father, our lives in the hereafter and to study about you and to learn more of you, Father, and to recognize your power, your glory, and the honor that we should honor you with. Father, we do thank you for that opportunity and the freedoms that we have to do that. Father, we're thankful for the blessings you give us each and every day of our life. Father, contemplating 
eternal life.